Looking for a guaranteed way to create content that resonates with your audience? Start a podcast, interview your ideal clients, and let them choose the topic of the interview. Because if your ideal clients care about the topic, there's a good chance the rest of your audience will care about it too. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. In today's episode, we continue the conversation from yesterday's episode with Lauren Vaccarello. She is the former VP of Marketing and Customer Engagement at Box. She shared yesterday a systematic approach to breaking down your three high-level goals in starting your first ABM program. She was instrumental in leading the first ABM program at Box. And today she gets even more granular in the tactics and strategies she recommends from her lessons learned there. So with that, let's get back into the conversation with Lauren. So you touched a little bit on a few lessons learned throughout, as you've been talking about it, Lauren, you mentioned, you know, you've got to track at the account level, you don't necessarily need to invest a ton in technology in the early days as you get it going, especially if you're trying to kind of soft launch it and get some buy-in early before you're really asking for a ton more budget at a higher level within sales. What are some of the other lessons learned that you think you would have liked to have known early on in these days and and might be helpful for listeners too? Uh, So we went with the... (laughs) the hardest possible route in terms of account selection. Okay. So we said, we want to prove the effectiveness of what we're doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to find accounts that sales has had absolutely no luck with. They are like running into a brick wall. They have not had good account penetration. It just hasn't been working. What would have been so much easier is uh, doing land expand. So you have small deployments in existing accounts. And let's work with sales to expand deployments. And it'll happen faster. You'll have more success faster. We definitely went with the hardest road possible. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. You know what? If you're going to do something, you just might as well <laughs> might as well go for it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. the side of it is you cut your teeth on the hardest thing and make everything a lot, um, a lot easier and improves value more. Other things that we just, you don't know what you don't know is... In our mind, and we had a couple of people, eventually it started as one person on my team's part-time job with ATM, and then okay. the full-time job, and then we had another person who's full-time was on uh, account-based marketing. We're, you know, their full-time job, and they're thinking about ABM all day, the sellers, and you're like, okay, great, I've got five accounts from this AE, and we're going to work together on it. The AE has a lot more than five accounts that they're working on, and so right. does their EBR <laughs> <Hope> so. <laughs> or OBR that they're working with. Yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> So you can assume that, okay, we are going to go really deep into, you know, gee, we're going to get everything about them. And obviously their EBR, OBR is going to go in and like call everyone in G and find everyone and really like pound the pavement for G. The OBR, EBR, depending on what they're called in the organization, is like, yeah, I'm going to go call these other accounts that are easier. And the rep told me to do this. And what's that thing (laughs) that you're doing? Um, So don't. Even when they're really excited and supportive, don't assume that that is the only thing that they're doing and working on, which is honestly why we ended up doing the external appointment setting. And we Mm -hmm. ended up letting the OBRs focus on the whole breadth of the AU's territory. And then we really went deep on the accounts that a rep would have um, in in the ABM program. So that was definitely a good reminder and lesson. One of my favorite tips that I was like, I can give this that I just, I thought worked really, really well 
So I talk about a bath and getting, you want reps in the room with your target accounts and with key decision makers and target accounts. And yeah, so I haven't been a seller in, in years. So I, it's up to them to sort of, once they get, we get them in a room, I'm not going to close the deal. I need to get them in a room, give them an at that, and then it's sort of up to them. Mm -hmm. So things that we did, how do I get them in a room in a really targeted way? That's also a natural organic setting. So we ended up partnering our ABM program with our field marketing program. And Mm -hmm. we have a whole field marketing program that's going into territory. And we had, obviously, all of our ABM accounts mapped by territory. So for the field marketer covering Central, she also knew, well, yep, I've got Central. I have my whole territory, blah, blah, blah. I have, you know, 30 accounts in Central that are part of the ABM program. And if I am running an event in Chicago, I need to make sure that any ABM account that is in or near Chicago not only gets invited, but I really sort of go above and beyond to try to get them in the room. Mm -hmm. And I make sure that rep is there. And if I am sponsoring a trade show or there's some sort of sponsored event that I, that is in Chicago, I now want to call that event and say, Hey, can you invite these three people for me? Can you invite these people from these accounts for me to your event? Mm -hmm. And Hey, if you're hosting this, you know, event sponsored dinner, can you get these? Can you invite these people to this dinner for me? And after you do, I want them to sit next to my rep. And you know, you don't know what they'll say no to unless you ask. Right. And for us, it was like, how do we make sure we provide as many opportunities as possible? Once yeah. I give them the opportunity, I'm not going to be the one to close the deal, but I'm going to give the reps as many chances as they can. Yeah. I love that idea of kind of the next level orchestration, not just helping them book sales calls and demos, but uh, giving them the opportunity to rub shoulders with the accounts that they they want to be in front of in other sorts of ways. <laughs> kind of ask for forgiveness, not permission there. You know, what's the worst thing that the, that event organizer is going to say? No. Okay. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and then you're like, ah, all right. All right. Fine. I just figured I'd ask. Oh. I love that. Well, Lauren, this has been a great conversation. And anything else that you would add? You mentioned, you know, some some technology, the account selection. That's what I was thinking of earlier as you were mentioning you guys kind of going the hard route of, uh, you know, let's find the ones where a sales has just been beating their head against the wall and we'll help them break in and we'll be the heroes. You know, maybe there's some, there's some learning to be had there. Maybe there's a better way in. Do you recommend, and you have a whole slide and some of the technology and other pieces, and, and you mentioned using the outside agency for appointment standing and sales development. Would you recommend folks kind of look at, you know, predictive intent data, that sort of stuff on the front end that yeah. that, that could be a crucial piece to, to really getting some earlier quick wins or maybe start starting at least not up such a steep hill as, as you guys did. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So we ended up doing sort of the proof of concept, and then we did a, a small pilot and then we sort of went all in on it. Mm-hmm. For the small pilot to all in, and we did the transition, what I'd really recommend doing, part of the reason we had to do this the really grassroots way was also know the culture of your organization. And this was just the better path. So how we did when we did the actual pilot is, and then uh, we changed it again to the real method um, when we actually launched the program was sitting down with sales and saying sales and actually sales leadership, not the individual, you know, opportunistic rep and sales leadership and said, I want a list of who are the most important accounts for you to go after next quarter, next year, next year. And let's have sales and marketing come together and say, what is our one list? Because what you don't want to happen is marketing to build their account-based marketing target list and sales to build their target list. And there's like a 40% overlap. Because then again, sales will come back and say, these marketers have no idea what they're talking about or what they're doing. So build that list together. And the most important thing is once you have this list, sales, marketing, and honestly, customer success all need to know the list, all need to be bought in and have the same target account list. So the first time we did it in the pilot, it was still sort of marketing proving itself. So we took the target list from sale, from sales and basically just took their list and said, okay, we'll do it. Again, once we really proved the efficacy of the program, when we really launched the full program, we did a couple of things. So we, quick aside, we had 
we have an incredible data science team, and we ran a couple of models for S&B mid-market and enterprise of what are the best accounts according to sales and then according to a predictive model, our internal predictive model, and then also using a predictive analytic solution and who are the, t- who are the best accounts. And we establish this, we run the program, do regression analysis, and it turns out in SMB, the predictive programs far outperform what the sellers say in terms of who are the best accounts. In the enterprise, sales was actually really, really close. And sales and predictive of like who are the best accounts were actually like neck and neck in terms of what actually is the best accounts. And there are even some times that the sellers beat the predictive program. And you could say, well, you know what, the sellers, there are fewer accounts. They should know their program better. But what was really interesting in enterprise is when we took who the sellers said, these are the target accounts, these are the best accounts. And then we took the data from the predictive program and we overlaid the two. Where there was an overlap was a significant increase. So it's like sellers say this is good and the predictive program says this is good is sort of where the magic happened. So that's how we came up with the the basis of our target account list. So once we really launched the program was, okay, sales, what do you got who's important? Sort of our homegrown predictive data, our homegrown data, and then our predictive analytics uh, solution based on intent signals, all of this mm-hmm. other data, user fit models, who's the best, this is our overlap. And then we'd sit down with sales and say, this is our validated list. You go back and forth and then sales will say, Hey, you know, G's not on the list. You missed these. We want to add these opportunistically. And you're like, great. We are totally okay with expanding and adding things opportunistically. It doesn't quite fit the model, but we all know reality and models are different. And that's how we came up with and agreed on the, um, sort of the final, the final list for our program. And then we reevaluate, I think every six months or so just to see, does anything need to be added or subtracted? So that's really how we do the account selection now. I I like using predictive as a part for account selection. A lot of it is just for fit models, for overall intent and intent scores, who's in market and really pulling in some of that data is great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to do my best to, to kind of recap some of the things here, Lauren, because you have done a phenomenal job of unpacking so many tactical takeaways for listeners. I think, you know, what really hits me about the way that you guys structured it, or, or at least the way you learned after the fact is starting out with those three main goals of providing account intelligence, driving awareness and engagement, and then helping sales land and expand and really looking at all of your efforts broken into those three buckets, I think can make launching an ABM program that much more approachable for folks. Some of the things that you touched on that I think uh, are really, really helpful for listeners. We just talked about it there, aligning with sales on account selection, using a mix of sales's input as well as predictive and, and intent data. You touched on it a couple of times, tracking on the account level, not on the contact level. The third one I had was try a pilot I think that's so important. I think everyone's talking about sales and marketing alignment, especially within ABM. They understand that it's important, but I think you laid out a very great game plan on how to actually effectively do that. And then the last two are, you know, working with sales and not just sales leadership in the way that you guys executed your pilot program. And then last but not least, track those short, mid and long term goals and be very granular about those so that you can see, are you heading in the right direction? And you can, uh, not not to use a word you wanted to get away from, but so that you can get credit for those quick wins yeah. and those <laughs> uh, those midterm wins, because it's not about credit, it's about, you know, maintaining the momentum of the program if you want to get a budget for, you know, a fully built out ABM team. So Lauren, I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. I feel like you've given so many tactical takeaways, as I mentioned to listeners today. If anybody listening to this, I know they can find you on certain episodes of the Marketing Trends podcast. I've been listening and getting a ton of value, a lot of great guests on that show. Where can they find you there? Or if they just want to connect with you or ask any follow-up questions on all of the great content you've shared with us today, what's the best way for folks to find you? 
Uh, sure. Um, definitely Marketing Trends Podcast. Uh, twice a week, great episodes, great guests. Uh, you get a lot of humor and sarcasm from me, fun <laughs> stories, and incredible other speakers. I am publicly on Twitter at Lauren Bay. I promise to respond more often. Find me on LinkedIn, um, or you can email me on the, the mission, uh, which is just Lauren at the mission. Awesome. I love it. Lauren, thank you again for being on the show today. This was a ton of fun. Thank you for having me. Digital marketing agencies have a tough job. You have to stay on top of the latest marketing strategies for your clients and your agency. What if there was a way you could address both at the same time? Imagine your agency putting out content with greater quality and quantity. Envision bringing your clients a turnkey solution for one of B2B marketing's fastest growing media strategies, podcasting. You know all those clients asking for your help with their account-based marketing efforts? Picture being the first to bring them the idea of content-based networking, showing them the proven strategy for breaking into their most coveted accounts. Here's the concept. Sweetfish Media is looking to work with a limited number of innovative agencies interested in a new partnership model. We produce a podcast for your agency. You introduce the power of podcasting and Sweetfish services to your clients. Everybody wins. Learn more at sweetfishpartners.com.